Are you struggling with tape together solutions for your professional service clients like architects, engineers, consultants, or lawyers? BQE Core is an all-in-one app for project management. Stay tuned to learn more from our sponsor, BQE Core, later in this episode. You know, you, you know, everyone complains about, or at least all the cloud accounting firms complain about having clients that insist on coming to the office and meeting with you in person. So what if to deal with those clients, you just set up an office where it's a virtual receptionist who ushers them into, you know, and they unlock remotely a conference room that they go into and it's just a Zoom room and they sit down and then you meet with them virtually over Zoom and they're sitting in the conference room. That could be actually interesting if you have clients that are not tech savvy. They don't have the technology, yeah. right? The tech savvy. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by ClockShark. Times are tough, and now more than ever, your clients with teams in the field are looking to reduce their contact and automate their manual paperwork processes. The team at ClockShark has been busy scrambling to keep up with this demand by helping accountants move clients from frustrating paper timesheets to their much-loved mobile time tracking app. ClockShark includes features like crew tracking, scheduling, overtime notifications, routes, geofencing, locations, job costing, budgeting, and reporting. You can easily integrate your client's ClockShark account with QuickBooks, ADP, Paychex, Zero, and Gusto for a payroll and a few clicks. ClockShark has built a robust mobile time tracking app to handle the unique challenges that face your mobile workforce clients. To try ClockShark for free for 14 days, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash ClockShark. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-L-O-C-K-S-H-R-K. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by OnPay. OnPay is a top-rated payroll app that is the right fit for all your clients, whether they have just one or 500 employees. OnPay brings everything together in the cloud and can handle all the complicated stuff like agricultural payrolls, Form 943, multi-state, and H-2A visas. OnPay even makes it easy to switch from other payroll services by doing all the data entry for each client account that you set up. Right now, Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners can get three free months of OnPay payroll services. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash OnPay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-N-P-A-Y. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Congratulations, Blake, on the tax deadline. This is like the final deadline of 2020, right? The real one. Yeah. Well, I I don't know if I'm doing any congratulations other than getting my own return in by October 15th. I didn't didn't have any tax work myself. But with all the... There was like 25 deadlines this year. (laughs) I know. It's finally (laughs) over, right? Congratulations to our listeners for making it. I hope that... You are relaxing. We are recording on Sunday, October 18th, and I hope you are sitting back with a margarita somewhere that's not too cold, you know, enjoying a little bit of what's left of the summer, if you could say that. Ah. Catching up on past episodes of the podcast you missed the last couple of weeks. That's true. Good, good, good use of time. Yeah, we, we did get a review from somebody who said that they downloaded the entire back catalog, which is Kind of crazy considering that we're almost at 200 episodes and we've been going for almost three years now. Not only did she say she accidentally downloaded all the episodes, she said she's actually listening to all of them. Well, let's hear that review. This review is on Podchaser. It's a five-star review from Julie Sigety, CPA. I'm an auditor at a small public accounting firm and don't work directly with our cast department. I still find David and Blake's podcast informative and fun because the items they discuss have overall relevance, especially if these items start to show up in the companies I audit. This podcast is a must listen. I also accidentally added all unplayed episodes from the podcast to my personal playlist through my podcast player app. I decided instead of manually clearing or re aggregating my playlist that I would just listen to the entire backlog since 2018. All of the shows I've listened to so thus far have been worth, worth listening, even though they are older since David and Blake give their breakdown, which is great for a young accountant to hear. I've just arrived at the 2020 predictions episode and can't wait to hear how 2020 unfolds through your eyes. You know, I haven't revisited that episode, so I hope that our predictions, they're probably way off given that when we recorded that, we had no idea what was going to come in 2020. <laughs> I, I think there was zero COVID. Yeah. yeah. It was not even a, a twinkle in our eye. 
Oh my gosh. Well, we got another review and and Julie, by the way, will be I think happy with my or interested to hear my top story, which is all about audit. But before that, let's get to the other reviews. We've got one from Angela here. What would my podcast list be without David and Blake? It's hard to keep on top of all the developments in the cloud accounting world. These guys make it fun and easy to stay in the know. Thank you, Angela, for that review on, was that Podchaser? That's Podchaser. And then we have uh, one more five-star review that came in through Apple Podcasts. This is from uh, Marie P. 86. I, she actually uh, sent me a LinkedIn message. It's Marie Phillips, who hmm. was uh, on the podcast once as a guest. Awesome. Hi, Marie. Back in the day. David and Blake, I love your podcast. There is always a new tool to discover, a tip to run my business more efficiently, and a new idea to pitch to our clients or the latest information about industry trends. Everyone can benefit from listening. I run a cloud-based accounting firm and a huge tech nerd and constantly read up on the latest tools. And yet, each episode, I learn or discover something new without an exception. You're with me when I want and need a break from work or drive to the beach on the weekends. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marie. Great to hear from you. And uh, and thank you for that review. And if you, our listeners, would like to leave a review, where's the best place to do that, David? If you're an Apple user, go right to your Apple Podcast app and leave a review there. If you are listening on any other possible platform, device, etc., you want to head over to podchaser.com, find the Cloud Accounting Podcast, and you'll see reviews and you could just leave a review. That's great. Well, I told Julie that my top story is an audit story and she's an auditor. So I think you'll like this, Julie. I was amazed to see this headline in the Wall Street Journal. String of firms that imploded have something in common. Ernst & Young audited them. Now that is not exactly the headline that Ernst & Young probably wanted to see in the Wall Street Journal. It's basically a roll up of the issues that have been plaguing Ernst & Young's audit department across the world uh, since $2 billion went missing at Wirecard in Germany, $300 million in sales were fabricated at Luckin Coffee in China, and $5 billion in undisclosed debt was found uh, at two related public companies in the UK. EY also, by the way, audited WeWork, which while it didn't implode, their IPO definitely imploded. And I highly recommend taking a look at this article if you haven't seen it and you're in the audit world or you just have an interest in public markets. It does a great job of like summarizing or just digging into what is going on? Why is EY having these issues versus the other firms? Why isn't this happening at KPMG or PwC, right? And th there, there are a few theories that the Wall Street Journal identified. One is that EY had ties with executives and board members at some of its troubled audit clients. And in some cases, former EY partners sat on the company's boards, including their audit committees. So while it might be legal or not against the rules, that creates ethical, potential ethical issues with those relationships. How do you stay independent? EY also charges lower fees for audits. They deliberately do this. They underbid the other big four firms in the US and Europe on average. That's according to uh, data from research firm Audit Analytics. Now, why do they do that? Well, it's because EY has been deliberately focusing more than other firms on auditing young, fast-growing technology companies. So they have been doing significantly more IPOs every year than every other firm. They go after these young tech companies and they charge them less for audits. They bid less to be competitive to get their lucrative business as they grow later on, which would presumably include the, that IPO work. And when companies are getting ready to go public, they, you know, they'd become much less price sensitive. But when they're small and you know growing, like Series A, B, C, that sort of thing, uh, they're really looking to save on those audit fees so they can use that money to grow. So I think it's a good summary of like some of the potential ethical issues in the audit profession. That you know when you're running your audit firm like a business in that way, then it could create potential conflicts of interest, right? And just resource uh, constraints. And then it kind of makes sense, right? So I'm imagining, right, a lot of startups, they're going fast, they're young, they just formed a business, right? They're still getting their, their business processes and bookkeeping processes and accounting processes, right? Yep. Organized. So it's probably a mess to begin with. And then you're, then they're going with the cheapest auditor who's probably like in most auditing situations, they're putting their, some interns on it. It's just like lots of inexperience just stacking up. Is that the real problem here? It's just they're, they're, because if you put an intern on Coca-Cola, 
who's had 85 years of established accounting practices and procedures, right? There's probably less wackiness going on. It doesn't mean it doesn't, there's not something happening, but I, but I can't imagine what, if you put somebody without experience to audit an organization that probably doesn't have tight controls and processes and procedures, like we're asking for trouble. Yeah. I think you're going down the right path there. It's, I really doubt there was just outright audit failure due to negligence. It's more that there's this, like you pointed out, this resource constraint where you've got inexperienced people auditing clients that are inherently more risky than other types of clients. Coca-Cola, established company, much less risky than Wirecard, you know, fast growing fintech startup. Yeah. No crazy new type of a business model that never existed before. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, and that's, that's the question is, is EY just getting all this bad press because they're in a inherently risky industry that they've chosen to focus on? Or is this more systemic? And that we'll probably have to wait to figure out. And it was on the front page. I opened up my Wall Street Journal app on my iPad, and this was on the front page. Like, it's not often that audit makes the front page. Well, I think in general, right? Like, it's almost like in professional football. Like, you, you never want to hear about those offensive linemen. But if they ever do, that means they made a big mistake. Right? <laughs> right. So it's kind of the same thing. Like it, it, accounting should never be on the front page. Especially audit. Right? That's for like sure. Major, yeah. But when auditors are doing their job, you, you don't even know they exist, right? Yeah. So that's my audit story. I got app news. Zoom had their big user conference and released a ton of new features or announced features that are coming supposedly by the end of the year. We got some more info on the Robinhood hack that hit like 2,000 accounts. Um, I've got news about Revolut, TD Bank in the fintech world, mm, accountants moving more to advisory services, but not charging for PPP. Surprising. I, I had some uh, APIs. Uh, Square released some APIs. Bank of America released some APIs uh, that are interesting looking. Um, what's uh, Receipt Bank is now going to do bill pay. Oh. Um, and two at QuickBooks in Australia got uh, approved for some open banking type milestones. And then I have a little PPP update that was from the investigation. What should we hit first? You want to get straight into app news? Yeah, why not? All Let's right, in. let's do it. Okay, so app news. Uh, can we start with Zoom? I mean, Zoom has yeah. taken over our lives, right? We're all on Zoom all day long. You know, people have been critical of it. It's, it's easy to get fatigue, but, uh, you know, I don't think that's Zoom's fault. In my, my own opinion, I think it's just, you know, the nature of of remote work is you're sitting in one place for a lot. And that can be challenging when you're used to like getting up and moving around the office and going to conference rooms. Some people like sitting at their desk all day long. Some people don't. Uh, the good news is that Zoom is working to improve their product and, you know, make it more friendly, especially as customers reenter the office and enable hybrid workforces. And that was the focus of their user conference, Zoomtopia, where they announced some big features. One of the coolest features is this virtual receptionist you can set up a Zoom device in Zoom Rooms kiosk mode and visitors to your building can now walk up instead of to a person sitting at a desk, you can have a branded display and they can remotely engage with a receptionist virtually over Zoom. This is supposed to be available in beta by the end of 2020, which makes a lot of sense to me, right? Why pay to have somebody there physically when you could have a receptionist sitting anywhere in the world, helping people get the information they need and pointing them to the right office. So when they show up to the front desk of a building, so people yeah. are. Yeah. Or your office, right? They walk up and normally there's a person. So if you're letting people come to your office, like why do you like, that means you're comfortable with COVID exposure or, or like, like they don't, you don't have to have your receptionist working from home. They could be there too. Well, if, you, if you're letting clients come to your office. It's, it's, well, so here's the thing. Um, I think the receptionist is a position where you're interacting with everybody who comes into the office and you're in a high traffic area. So it's inherently more risky okay. than like meeting with people in a private office or a big conference room or something like that. So this way you can protect that person and, you know, be more efficient in, in general. Like I'm thinking like maybe this is the way that reception goes in the future. Like we're all going to be walking into buildings and instead of there being a person, there will be a screen. You interact with the receptionist who can be anywhere. Yeah, it'll be outsourced. But then I was thinking that, you know, it would be really funny if, you know, you, you know, everyone complains about, or at least all the cloud accounting firms complain about having clients that insist on coming to the office and meeting with you in person. So what if to deal with those clients, you just set up an office where it's a virtual receptionist who ushers them into 
you know, and they unlock v- remotely a conference room that they go into and it's just a Zoom room and they sit down and then you meet with them virtually over Zoom and they're sitting in the conference room. Well, that could be actually interesting if you have clients that are not tech savvy. They don't have the technology, yeah. right? I'm tech savvy. That would be really you cool, say, right? Okay, go to this, go to this site and you can, and actually this could be a, a whole business spin up, right? Yeah. You could just offer this as a service. Like I understand you have client, like it doesn't matter what field you're in, right? Yeah. And then you have, they can go to this location. They have secure video conferencing with you. And maybe you even have to do that. Let's say it's legal, right? And you, you can't have them using their computer at home. Like, yeah, there's probably a business in here somewhere. I think so. And uh, you could even have them leave their like shoebox full of documents on the conference table and then have somebody come in afterward and grab it and scan Spray them, <laughs> disinfect them. <laughs> what else did they announce? So the other feature is uh, Zoom Rooms, which is this, there's this like scheduling display that you can install at the outside of every conference room that links into the cameras in the room. So now the, that system is going to be able to count the capacity and the number of people in the room and tell you if it's safe to go in based on your firm's uh, rules about capacity. So uh-huh. if normally a conference room fits eight people, but you're only supposed to have four people in it, it can tell you if it's reached capacity and you don't have to have that awkward conversation. Is it going to make them wait in the waiting room and then you have to admit them into the physical <laughs> conference room? <laughs> yeah. Maybe it'll like quarantine you into a... Uh, now, now that real Zoom's done that for everybody. <laughs> so, so that's one of the most annoying things. And it's weird too. Like I find that some people are automatically admitted, whereas other people get put in the waiting room and I don't know why. I can't figure it's it. if you pa- if you if you give them the URL with the password built into the URL, uh-huh. they just get straight in. Oh, it's very you know. okay. They're going to have enhanced voice commands for Zoom rooms, so you don't have to touch the display. You can just start the meeting by saying "Hello Zoom, start meeting." That's smart. They've got Alexa for business integration, so you could like connect your Zoom room to an Alexa device. Enhanced dashboard reporting. That's kind of interesting. So Zoom admins will be able to monitor the safety of the environment by receiving dashboard insights such as the temperature, air quality, and in-room attendees of a room. This feature requires supported hardware and is expected to be supported by December. I mean, I'm imagining that, like, what if Zoom came up with a way to detect coronavirus, like, in the air? You know, they would they would own that whole, uh, you know, safety protocol right there. So, yeah, just some other cool things like Zoom Room Smart Gallery. So, if you've got a group of four people in a conference room and you're not in that conference room, it can sometimes be hard to see people's faces given the resolution of these cameras. So now they've got this like setup where it can basically take the uh, video from multiple angles in the room and then construct a gallery for you. So if you're not in the room, you can see everybody's face. Just a, just some amazing innovation going on there. And apps, right? They have their own, they, they're, they have an app store. Yeah. So, I mean, the list just goes on. So, they've, they've created an app store called Zaps. Uh, not Zapier, Zaps. I, yeah. I don't know how they're getting away with that. Maybe we'll see some uh, movement. I know Zapier suing Zoom. I don't know, but they're called Zap, Z A P P S. So, that will allow you to integrate other apps like Slack, Asana, Box, Dropbox, Jira into your Zoom meetings. And then finally, Zoom has enhanced their SDK, which is the set of developer tools that would allow third-party developers to integrate Zoom into their applications. So I think we were talking about how this would be great, David, where if you have a, a conference platform, why not just like integrate Zoom into that rather than trying to build your own video audio? Because that's one of the things that Zoom has done really well and, and other apps have trouble with. So yeah, that's that's the updates from Zoom. So I'll tie on to this. Uh, you know, you'd mentioned Zoom fatigue, right? Mm-hmm. So there's an article by NPR. Basically, CEOs are saying it's time to ditch Zoom. And, and I think like they're using Zoom. Zoom's now the word just for video conferencing, I think. Yeah. Right? I don't think this is specific to Zoom. So what's interesting, JP uh, Morgan Chase, uh, CEO, Jamie Dimon, said uh, there's no c- creative combustion happening in virtual meetings. American Airlines CEO, Doug Parker, finds Zoom meetings awful. Microsoft CEO... Satya Nadella calls them transactional and said, after 30 minutes of your first video call in the morning, you're just fatigued for the rest of the day. It just kills you. Yeah. Now, what's interesting, these same CEOs in April were touting the benefits of this. Um, Morgan Stanley, CEO, he said that they've proven they can operate with no footprint, but now they've come up and flipped the other complete direction now. They're saying that um, as human beings, we need and seek, we need, uh, we want and seek human contact. A study was done by, uh, there was a survey was out in an architect and design firm, Vocon, V-O-C-O-N. They conducted a survey and 
they've seen decreases now. So remember how everybody was like, oh, everybody's super productive before last April, last May. So they found that 40% of the people who ran a business have noticed decreases in productivity from remote working staff among the same group in April, 56% rated the productivity as excellent. Wait, say that so the, Say that again. Okay. Yeah. Let me reread this again. Cause yeah. it, it's, it, I missed that. Those numbers. So to summarize it back in April, this group of people they surveyed rated productivity as excellent. And now the same group of people they've resurveyed in September and 40% of these people are saying they've noticed a decrease in productivity. Mm. So it's starting to flip a little bit on how people's opinions of this is. And now they're starting to get, you know, people's, People are starting to have questionable behavior. Have you ever done this? Have you been on a call and just go on mute and go use the bathroom? Oh, of course. Who doesn't? One in 10 people have admitted to that. Oh, only one I, in I've, 10? I've, oh, no. I, I've cooked breakfast with, with the tablet up on the top part of the counter while I'm trying to... You, you kind of have to fit this in around your life. You can't just be on Zoom calls nonstop. I have a confession to make. I did a... Well, I had this long two-hour meeting that I'm part of with you know 12 people. And it's one of those things where I have to be on just to be in the know, but I really don't contribute that much to it. And I, I, I worked out while I was on that call. <laughs> I turned off my video and nobody knew. Yeah, some people are new to exercising and taking a shower during the meeting. <laughs> so, so it's, it's, it's getting very interesting where, you know, people are just clicking on, it's almost like turning on background noise. You turn on your Zoom meeting and it's just running in the background. <sighs> So, workplace consultant Corn Ferry found in a survey that as few as in 14% of employers say returning to the office every day will be mandatory. What percent said it would be mandatory? Only 14%. 14%. Yeah. So it'll be mandatory. So, we talked last week about how Microsoft is moving to 50% yep. in person and, and they're calling it a hybrid approach. And I think that your data there says suggests that that's where we're headed as a workforce of professionals. Professionals are going to be hybrid. Maybe we'll have like 14% virtual companies, right? which would be a huge increase over what it is now, which is like in the low single digits. And but here's the... Go ahead. Uh, good news or not good news. I don't know how you want to say this, but so we have our survey we're doing for the accounting finance show mm -hmm. that we're going to... So the survey is going to be turned off on Monday night at midnight. And one of the questions we do ask is for accounting firms and bookkeeping firms to talk about their... If they're going to return to the office, they're going to get rid of their office. So we're going to have some real numbers on this. Oh, yeah. Just specifically for the accounting world. That's great. Yes. Well, just to kind of wrap this up, the Zoom fatigue happens when – well, I think what these CEOs are pointing out that we mentioned, like Jamie Dimon and stuff, is that it's really hard to have certain types of meetings on Zoom, like creative type of meeting, big picture type meetings. Uh, when you want to walk around and whiteboard and and really think about stuff. But then – some meetings are just transactional and they have to happen and you don't need to be in that conference room. And those are great for Zoom. And I think actually the majority of meetings are like that where you don't need to get together in person. So we still have to get together in person though. And I have some good news about that, which is a Department of Defense study of the risk of catching coronavirus on commercial flights found that even on a packed commercial flight, a person would have to be sitting next to an infectious passenger for at least 54 hours to receive a dangerous dose of the virus through the air. So believe it or not, the place that seems like it would be the least safe, a packed airplane, is one of the safest places you can be around other people. And that is because it's how the air is circulated and filtered on planes. The air in a plane is, is completely exchanged with the air outside very frequently. And so that is what prevents the virus from building up in the air. And the way viral infection works with COVID, it's not like all you need is one, what do you call them? Load. I think they call it the yeah, exposure it's like, load. Like yeah. some people think, oh, if I get a single virus on me, then I'm going to get sick. But that's not how it works. You have to get a, a, like a certain amount of the virus in your lungs, and then it can take over and start propagating. Otherwise, your natural immune system can kill it very quickly. So- it's all about just not getting that big dose. And that's why being close to people, being next to them a lot is what gets you sick. It's it's time and uh, proximity. So office buildings are going to have to have HVAC systems are more similar to airplanes where it's constantly sucking in clean air from the outside, filtering it, and it, taking old bad air and shoving it out the other side. Yeah. If you could set up a conference room in your office where you have that kind of system, where it's constantly being recirculated, or like in hospital ICUs where... You know, you have the air coming in and circulating 10 times per hour. People aren't going to get sick. I mean, as long as they're not like 
you know, kissing and hugging each other. It's the fresh air. It's new air coming in. Right. And and the old air going out. And this is why it's almost impossible to get COVID being outside. As long as you're, you know, six feet away from people, it's, it just doesn't happen. Statistically, it doesn't happen. So we got to figure that out. Um, so it's, it's, but so going back to the zoom thing, this is great because it means that as long as we can find locations where we can get together with people where we're not spreading it in bad air circulation kind of environments, uh, we can go meet people again. We can get together and do it safely. Offsites at beer gardens. Yes. Essentially. Offsites at beer gardens. Totally uh, awesome. Just in principle and also very safe. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by BQE Core. I recently had two Zoom calls with accountants that use BQE Core for their professional service clients like architects, engineers, consultants, and lawyers. One accountant called it the missing link for professional services. Another said BQE Core is the only game in town for professional service firms. My biggest takeaway from the conversations was how you can use BQE Core as your standalone accounting system or pair it with either QuickBooks Online or Xero. Either way, you'll get to take advantage of all the features of BQE Core like smart timers, project management, budgeting, forecasting, and project accounting. Because BQE Core is an all-in-one app, it is easy to manage all your projects and people for maximum productivity and ultimate profitability. To learn more about BQE Core, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash core. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-O-R-E. Perfect your project management workflow with BQE Core. You want to jump into some of that smaller app news? I think you had something about Robinhood or I had something about Robinhood or... Uh, yeah, I think we both had um, follow-up on this. We talked about Robinhood. You talked about Robinhood last week and the hacking, and we've got some more information about that. A Robinhood internal probe that was leaked to the press found that hackers have hit almost 2,000 accounts. And the scary thing about this, in my opinion, is that some of these customers said that they had two-factor authentication turned on and had not had any intrusion into their email accounts. So there's a big question as to how these hackers got into these accounts. And then, of course, the really distressing thing is that there's no phone number for Robinhood. So the people that have had their money taken out have had widely divergent experiences as to whether or not it got fixed. One person, Lena Williams, she's an HR pro, pro in the Chicago area. She's one of those people that had two-factor authentication turned on and still got hacked. She said her account was hit on September 10th, and her repeated emails and a Twitter message were not returned until Thursday of this past week, so like a month later. So just to to rewind here, just to make sure our listeners understand. So if you have two-factor authentication on and there's no compromise of your email or your cell phone text messages or, or, or your app that you maybe keep your two-factor authentication code in, if, if none of that's been compromised, that means they didn't come in pretending to be you to get into your account. They got in through a back door. And the back door could have been Robinhood itself going through their customer support and getting them to reset or turn off two-factor authentication and that's often how this stuff happens is it's, it's a social hack. Yes. Yeah, social it's, hacks. It's, yeah. And, and there's some indication that's what happened And um, one person had two factor turned on and then got a note that somebody was trying to get into their account. So uh, the beauty of two factor is that let's say somebody steals your password. Well, they still have to have your phone, the authentication code on your two factor app on your phone, that six digit number that changes every minute. They don't have that. So then they say, okay, I'm going to try and do a password reset. I'm going to try to get Robinhood to turn off two-factor authentication so I can break in. And this has to happen. This, there, there has to be a way for Robinhood to do this because sometimes people lose their phones and they don't have the codes. So what you do is you call up Robinhood and you say, I'm David Leary and I can't get into my Robinhood account because I lost my phone. Can you help me turn off two-factor? And then they'll say, oh yeah, Mr. Leary, I'm happy to help. Send me a proof that you are Mr. Leary. And then you send in your driver's license and maybe a bill or something like that. And so it really depends on how good is Robinhood's security. If they have that layer of right. additional verification. And apparently somebody got hacked this way where somebody like pretended to be them and sent in a driver's license that didn't even – it was an Arizona license that like had the wrong font on it. And Robinhood still took off the two-factor and allowed the account to get hacked. So like this is a problem with 
these new tech companies that are doing financial transactions and becoming banks is that like they may not have the security in place that a big bank has to prevent this kind of stuff. There's a reason it's a huge hassle when you forget your password at a Bank of America or Chase to get that fixed. And you have to often go into a branch to verify your identity. No, that makes sense. Um, so I got news about Sage Intact quickly. App update from Sage Intact, David. Uh, do you remember how they finally enabled bank reconciliations earlier this year? Or maybe it was last year. That was a big deal. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah. So like this is one of those things that's funny about ERP systems is like some basic stuff that we would expect in QuickBooks or Xero just isn't there, like bank reconciliations. People were still doing them in Excel uh, and often are doing that with a lot of ERP systems, still doing it in Excel. Well, Sage Intact finally released um, bank feeds. And now with their Sage Intact release three, you can reconcile your credit cards using uh, the similar tool. So import your transactions, reconcile them right in the system, uh, match transactions, all that stuff. So that's that's there. They have also enabled recurring journal entries on a schedule with optional automatic reversal as well, which is uh, pretty nifty and, and actually beats out QuickBooks and Zero in the way that it's uh, implemented. So I have uh, two API news from uh, Bank of America and Square. I'll switch up into that. And then I have three that are a little bit more um, international news, like outside the US market. So let's jump into uh, Bank of America first. Okay. So Bank of America has uh, started, they are now offering three new APIs. They call it their Cash Pro Treasury product. So basically, these are APIs that are available to really uh, larger business institutions. That can, that can use these for their treasury manager, treasury management. And the one that caught my eye, so one of the things is uh, FX settlements. So if they're doing cross-border payments, they can uh, initiate this through APIs now and manage it more directly. Uh, another one is reporting. Apparently, scheduling and pulling of reports has always been a manual process. So now through the API, teams can get these reports seamlessly pulled and delivered out of the API. But the other one that I thought was really interesting is check image retrieval. To assist with account reconciliation, clients can now directly retrieve multiple images of checks that have been posted to their account. So hopefully, if a bank is now offering check image retrieval like this through an API call, hopefully they roll this down to the consumer level or the small business level yeah. of API calls and let apps go get those check images. Because right now, there are some apps that go out and retrieve these check images, but I think they do a lot of screen scraping. To get them, there's a lot of uh, manual manual programming, if you want to call it that, right? They're not using API to get these. And so this is kind of encouraging the fact that Bank of America is recognizing there is a need to retrieve check images and making it a doable through an API call. Um, now, it's not an API call everybody has access to, but it's I think it's a nice, important step one. So what I'm hearing is this is through their treasury management services. So big companies, let's say I'm a Fortune 500 company, I bank with Bank of America. Now I can integrate, I could probably pay somebody to integrate my ERP system so that I'm automatically pulling check images. Uh, I'm automatically settling transactions, moving cash without having to like log into their system to do it. Yeah. And even um, do a uh, Zelle and ACH and PayPal. So they pretty much, if you're a Fortune 500 company, you can do through Bank of America's APIs, manage all these as bunch of aspects of of your interactions with Bank of America through APIs. Cool. I mean, it's a good sign. It's a step, right? Yeah. If they're doing for big corporations, that means eventually they open these APIs up to more developers, hopefully one day. Well, speaking of, that was an established bank. Let's talk about a challenger one, Revolut. The European fintech giant Revolut, which has 13 million users in the EU, is applying for a bank charter in California, according to unnamed sources in a CNBC story. They are planning on applying for a charter with the Fed... Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco uh, in a matter of weeks. And now, even though the bank charter will be with California, it will allow the lender to operate widely throughout the U.S. via interstate agreements. So we're going to see Revolut jump into the U.S. Uh, as a bank. Yeah, they'll be competing with Square. They'll be competing with Square. Uh, now, now, something that is going to make people want to switch over to Revolut is a promotion they're doing. They are offering a crazy 5% savings rate, 5% savings rate, which I don't know if you've looked at your savings rate in a while, David, but it's pretty uh, pretty low, right? If, if even existent. Uh, and the way they're doing this is it's only on the total amount you spent the previous month. So Revolut, for our listeners who don't know how their whole 
thing works because they're a free bank, right? Free di- uh, online bank that you access through an app. They make money based on your spending on their debit cards and credit cards on the interchange rate. So if you're not spending money, then you're not making them any money, which is different than you know most banks, which make money from your deposits and lending money out. So that's why Revolut is doing this huge savings rate, but it's only on the amount you spent the previous month. So essentially, it's a, a rebate. It's, 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 it's a point card system. Yeah, but it's like framed up as a savings rate, which makes it look from a marketing perspective like amazing compared to a B of A. Oh, yeah. And by the time you sign up, you set up your account, you deposit money in. 30 days later is by the time you'll realize like, wait a minute. This isn't really paying me 5% interest. And by that time, you're already a customer and you're, you're locked in. Well, and most Revolut customers probably don't have a huge amount of savings because they're targeting that like lower end of the consumer market. And un- unbanked, unbanked. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, really interesting what's happening there. So Square had some uh, new APIs. So they've now released their terminal API. So you know how they have their little, that little white box now. You can either tap or insert your card in. Yeah. And and it's separate from their point of sale terminals in a way, right? Mm -hmm. I'm surprised people just don't accidentally take them because they're they're, they're not connected by a cable at all, right? They're just. Yeah, they're battery powered. Yep. Exactly. They're kind of just. They they almost look like a a phone charger for you could put your phone on and just charge it. So those devices obviously have worked with the Square point of sale system. Now they're opening that up. So you can now uh, integrate this with your ERP, your practice management system, um, your point of sale. You can so it's now you can use that device instead of having it's almost more like a um, Stripe, right? If I have an app and I need to have people pay me or move money, I'm going to implement Stripe in my app, and then people are using my app and they're using Stripe, but they don't even know they're using Stripe in a way, right? Kind of that same thing. Now I'm going to be able to instead of having my customer, maybe I have a practice management app instead of me having to use my practice management app to spin up the charge and then have to go over to Square and then put in the same information in Square and then saying, ask the customer to pay me in Square. Then I got to go process that payment to match up to the app right, later right. on. Now my app can have everything triggered, ready to go. And I just have them pay me. And basically my app handles all the stuff that the Square software would handle. Got it. Because so it's all doing it through the APIs. I can process the transactions using it, but I record it using my own system. I'm not locked into that Square point of sale. They're, divo- they're separating those two things. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, exactly, right. So I, I don't have to pull out my phone and run the Square software, right? Because there's API calls actually oh, cool. Square in the background, and that's kind of the way it goes. Well, and then because of that, now my app I can offer NFC and contactless payments, yeah. some cordless terminals via Wi-Fi. So there's lots of, uh, and then the distance, right? Yeah, you you yeah. can have somebody tap this and pay, and not actually have to touch your stuff or your phone and sign with your finger and all that kind of stuff. Well, that'll probably appeal to big retailers that have their own systems, right? But want to augment with all of this tech. Really neat. Uh, Last one for me on the app side, TD Bank has filed a lawsuit against Plaid. Plaid is that company that is the go-between that helps all the accounting apps pretty much make bank feeds possible in the United States. Bank feed APIs is the easy way to think about it. And then Plaid was bought by MasterCard. Visa, yes, they were. Oh, Visa, no, Plaid Visa. Was, Plaid was bought by Visa, and then the other one was bought by Mastercard, yes. and it was not priceless because it was five something like five billion dollars. Yes. Um, so TD Bank has filed a lawsuit against Plaid, accusing it of trying to quote dupe customers. They have said that Plaid is unlawfully using its logo to trick users into handing over personal data that can later be monetized. I think I know what's going on here. You know, when you log into, I don't know, you're in QuickBooks and Quick, does QuickBooks use Plaid? No. Okay. So Zero uses Plaid now. Zero uses Plaid. So when you log into your bank via Zero, the login screen that pops up has the same colors and logo as the bank. So it, it like, if you're logging into Bank of America, a lot of times you'll see like the red and the blue and the Bank of America logo. And I could see how people would think that that's a Bank of America login screen. But it's actually a Plaid login screen. And if it's a TD account that you're logging into, it'll be green and it'll have the TD logo. So TD is saying that this is illegal. They can't do this because it's confusing people and making them think that they're actually giving their password to TD Bank when they're not. And then Plaid, by the way, is using this information not just to create your bank feed, but they're making money off of it by mining your bank account for data and selling that data. I'm sure this is all in the terms of service that everybody reads. Right. Oh, yeah. I read all the terms of service, don't you? When you click on Plaid. 
But I, but I can I can see TD's point of view on this because if you think about Plaid, the very first time an app uses Plaid and they launch it up, it shows kind of like the eight top banks on there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a Bank of America logo. There's the Every bank has the Chase logo. And you're right. Like if Plaid did not use those logos. So imagine if Plaid did not use the logos and it first came up and it said, hey, we're going to connect to your bank. You know, search for your bank here. And it was all like kind of text. Yeah. it would People would bail out really early. But the fact that it opens up and it has your bank's logo like gives you this instant comfort factor. Like, oh, this must be legit. They're allowed to use the – Yeah, exactly. Why, why would Bank of America or TD let them use their logo if it's not – if they weren't – okay with this. So I, I see TD's point that, yeah, they're, they, they literally, the use of the logo almost implies it's okay to use this as a service. And I'm not saying that people should or shouldn't use the service. It's just, it really implies that they have some sort of approval from TD. And they don't. And I think a lot of people do not understand this, that Plaid is its own thing. They, they generally don't get permission and they're storing your login credentials and logging in like it's you. Uh, and you know, this is a big problem in, in the banking world in the US, like th- that this is not done in a more secure API driven way. It's basically a house of cards that could fall down in any second. So on that that's note, because we don't have that's because we do not have open banking. We do not have open banking. We don't have a public or we don't have standards for APIs for bank feeds or anything like that. Yeah. So in Australia, and I think we're going to have to have an Australian listener clarify this for me a little bit, but the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, has now accredited Intuit QuickBooks Australia as an accredited accredited data recipient of consumer data right in the banking sector. So this is where QuickBooks can connect right directly to the banks through APIs. They don't have to use a third-party service to go get the data from the banks or do screen scraping, et cetera. So what I found was interesting about this was the quote from QuickBooks, uh, or, uh, from QuickBooks on this. So this is um, Steve Kemp. He is the head of financial institutions and partnerships for the APAC region and emerging markets for Intuit QuickBooks. So it's a QuickBooks employee. He said, we're thrilled to let our customers know that we are the first software accounting company to be accredited in Australia for open banking. So this is where I think I need some help from Australian uh, listeners, and I'd love for somebody to call and leave us a voicemail. If you're out there, Matt Path, if you'd like to. If you really think about of all the accounting software packages and zero being the biggest one in Australia, how did Intuit become the first one to get access to open banking on this or accredited for this? Uh, I got one more bit of kind of tech news, but related to the IRS. The IRS has uh, been slowly modernizing, and they did something really nifty. They are adding QR codes to their balance due notices that they're sending out in the mail. CP14 and CP14IA balance due notices that inform taxpayers that they owe money on unpaid taxes and their payment options are now equipped with QR barcodes to help those taxpayers securely and easily navigate irs.gov. Taxpayers can now use their smartphones to scan a QR code on those forms to go directly to the website and securely access their account, set up a payment plan, or contact the taxpayer advocate service. Isn't it amazing that it took a pandemic for QR code adoption to happen in this country? Like now when I go to restaurants, uh, you know, instead of handing you a menu, there's a QR code on the table and you just scan that with your, your phone camera and it opens up the menu. It makes so much more sense. And QR codes are from like 96 like, could you imagine? Could you imagine? Like, you're that guy that had kids, you're, 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 your holiday dinners with families. And you're like, look, at, this is going to be big one day, and <laughs> and and then the internet came, and you're like, I swear it's still going to be big one day. And it, it, it took till 2020 for them to actually starting to get used across the board. Very, yeah. very, very common use now. <laughs> um, I think even Square now it's like that you can actually pay through QR codes now. Finally, well, I think it it took Apple forever to enable native QR codes. And that was probably the real problem. Like I think Apple deserves the blame in this because with Android phones, you've been able to open up your camera and just point at a QR code and it works right for years. Yeah. So I have some uh, app news out of the UK, two, two pieces of app news. So one is Starling Bank. So Starling Bank is a, a new banking startup. They have an app marketplace and now they've created an app called Paystream. And Paystream is essentially an app that's going to um, allow you to take a picture of your bills. It's almost like a self-employed type app for a contractor, but it's an accounting software app. 
So the bank is offering basically an accounting software app straight out of the box for people to track their mileage, track their expenses, take photos of bills. Um, I looked at it. It looks like a, a very poorly done version of a receipt bank. It doesn't look great. I went and looked at the, the app on the website. But the point is, is the banks continue to march down this path. Well, and you mentioned Receipt Bank. What's going on with them? Receipt Bank is now going into bill pay. So they are launching um, what they call as one place to pay. Obviously, with Receipt Bank, you could always scan your bills and then connect and move the bill out over to an accounting system. Now, they're taking the accounting system out of the equation. You scan the bill, the bill's inside of Receipt Bank, and you click a button and you pay the bill. And it works with all the banks in the UK. So that's only in the UK right now, right? Only in the UK. They do plan on rolling it to their other regions in 2021. So this continues this march, and we've talked about this before, of Receipt Bank, where they have their self-employed product. They may have applied for some sort of banking charter in the UK, I think, before with one of the releases. But they're on a march of like having their own GL. Will Receipt Bank be its own standalone accounting system very soon? Well, I think they need to definitely buy a bank or get a bank charter because they have a branding problem. <laughs> you know, they need to be a bank or somehow like have a banking type solution. That's my that's my position as a marketer. <laughs> they need to make that happen. Uh, and again, this goes to that grayness where everybody's getting each other lanes. We talked about it last week. Expensify is getting into bill pay. Receipt banks getting into bill pay. The banks are getting into accounting. Obviously, the accounting apps are getting into banking. It's getting very, very gray of whose lane and whose swim lane everybody's in. Yep. Shall we switch over to PPP? Why don't you start? Remember how people were very... Uh, not happy that a lot of underserved markets with the PPP loans, they weren't getting loans, right? Yeah. Small businesses. And we talked about this forever on the podcast. Like within a couple of within a week or two weeks of the PPP loan starting, I think you and I were on top of this, like, wait a minute, oh, yeah. they're only serving certain people. It, it was it was so clear that if you had an existing relationship with your bank, your application would go through super fast. People were getting the money. And then there were all these people that were applying with they would try multiple banks and they they weren't a customer and they were hearing nothing, especially the big banks. It was like just radio silence. So yeah, so the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus found that the US Treasury Department encouraged banks to prioritize existing customers that were applying for loans. I saw this too. It's interesting. It was um, according to an email sent by the CEO of the American Bankers Association, Rob Nichols, to the group's board of directors. And the Treasury said, quote, uh, that banks should, quote, go to their existing customer base, unquote, when issuing loans. Yeah, which is the, re the this is the reason why when you applied for a loan at some bank, you you never heard back because they're like, they're not an existing customer. They instantly put you in a different bucket. This is the the really damning thing is that seven out of the eight big banks only gave these loans to their existing clients. Seven out of eight. It, the headline might be worse than it, it is, though. In a way, because ultimately there was a lot of pressure to get these approved as fast as possible. And historical, the lending requirements of a new a new customer are super, super complex. Well, you got to get right? a lot of info from them. You have to know your customer according to the law. So they'd have to like verify identity. They'd have to do all this work they didn't have to do for existing customers. The primary focus was to get as many loans out as fast as possible. And right. so at some level, this was kind of a strategy that was kind of a good strategy, but it's also not a good strategy. And it kind of backfired because a lot of people uh, were hurt by this, right? Minority and women-owned businesses, for starters. Well, and, and simply, even if you don't put it through that lens, it's the businesses that needed the money most were the least likely to have existing banking relationships. So if your goal is to help businesses survive – Maybe a different strategy would have been better, right? To prioritize businesses that didn't have access to capital already. Now, the good thing is that people who wanted the money eventually got it. We've actually now have a problem where there is money left over in this program. About 130 billion still, right? Right. That's and, left, yeah. and people, they can't give it away. Like everybody who ha has wanted this money has now gotten it. Uh, but the problem was at the beginning of this whole thing that it just, the people who needed the money most got put at the back of the line. And a lot of those businesses probably went under waiting or didn't even know about it, honestly, because it wasn't that well you know, publicized to uh, businesses that didn't already have banking relationships. And they made it complicated. And so, yeah, I and mean- now the, 
the PR spin has started on this now because the banks don't want to look like the bad guys in this, right? And so a spokesperson from JP uh, Morgan, she told the Wall Street Journal, so they're trying to push this back on the Treasury. So she said, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, quote unquote, encouraged small businesses to go to their own banks for this reason. <laughs> about you know getting it quickly, so yeah. so they're gonna they're going to push this. The banks are going to push this off of them and put this on the treasury. Like the treasury is the one who told people to go with their banks. The treasury is the one that told the banks to service their own customers first. Yeah, right. They, the banks don't want to get the the bad press on this because um, they already are the big bad banks and they get enough bad press. And you know maybe Mnuchin needs to get some of this bad press. So let's stick sticking with PPP. We've talked in the past about a significant number of accounting firms that are not charging for PPP services. A CPA Trendlines survey said that 22% of respondents are not charging their clients for PPP services. 22%. And that includes services such as loan acquisition, loan forgiveness, review of Form 3508, tracing assistance, and risk management advice. Here's a bit from the story that's very revealing. Quote, I want my clients to survive, unquote, was a frequent comment when we asked why accountants decided not to charge them for PPP advice. So, I mean, to me, as somebody who owned a practice, the idea of doing all that work, I mean, I, I've done two PPP loans and they're, you know, they're not like ridiculous, but if I was doing them for all my clients, it would be a ton of work to not charge for that. It's just insane to me, but there's people who are out there arguing and saying, look, I, I, I feel bad. I can't charge my clients for this because uh, they're already hurting. And then you have other people on the other side saying like, look, you know, this is the reason that CPA firms uh, struggle is because they don't operate like businesses. People have had to use some creativity on this, right? And you you can balance that out like, hey, I'm not, I, I'm not going to charge you to do this or I'm going to charge you, you've survived the COVID crisis, right? But you almost value bill on it. Like, hey, I'm going to do this for free. We're going to help you get this through. And if somehow we can help you survive... You're yeah. going to pay me a little bit of a premium for helping you because I helped you survive. Yeah. I mean, pay me later, perhaps, would be even be a better option than not charging at all. A much better option. Meanwhile- But wasn't there pressure from like the AICPA and others telling people not to charge though? Well- And then also with this, you're going to get the you know the, the 1%. You're not going to get that either. The, the agent fee, agent the lender fee, fee yeah. agent fee. Yeah. So the AICPA thing caused, I think, some confusion, unfortunately, because the law said that you couldn't charge- people to prepare the PPP application. But but you could always come up with some other way to charge, just not directly for that one thing. So Yeah, like the reports right. you have to create to get the numbers to fill out. You could charge for report creation. But that created a whole ton of confusion. And then some people were like, well, I guess I can't charge for it. And they didn't. And then you know, it was just all very unclear. Uh, and I think that created a, a problem. Now, meanwhile, on the banking side, they've had no problem charging for what they've done, right? They earned those 1% to 5% fees on all the loans. Uh, estimates are that the banking industry earned 3% on the hundreds of billions of dollars of PPP loans out there. You know, We're talking tens of billions of dollars for this. And some bank employees have gone even further. Wells Fargo has fired around 100 to 125 employees suspected of improperly obtaining coronavirus relief funds. A source familiar with the situation told Fox Business. So this is you said Wells Fargo. Yeah, Wells Fargo. Okay, because so I think J.P. Morgan Chase had a little bit of their own internal investigation two, three weeks ago. Something they similar. did, but you know, I'm not surprised that Wells Fargo, of course, had the worst problem <laughs> given their reputation, right, and internal ethics. So, according to an internal memo that uh, Fox Business reviewed, the company said it identified workers who are believed to have defrauded the SBA by making false representations and applying for coronavirus relief funds for themselves. This was specifically for EIDL loans. So fraudulent EIDL loans by Wells Fargo employees who are now terminated. That's a lot of employees. I mean, I know Wells Fargo has a lot of people, but gosh, 100, over 100 employees? It's starting to feel like there's, there's almost, from a numbers perspective... It's starting to sound like more people that work for banks are getting in trouble for fraudulent PPP loans than just criminals that were applying for false PPP. And <laughs> Maybe. Loans. Yeah, actually. I mean, if you take that, we haven't heard about 100 PPP fraud stories from... I, I think, it, the, and I'll have to go back and see, but I think we, we had some numbers on this a couple of weeks ago and it was like 78 or something have been arrested, 78 arrests or something. It was not over 100. 
the amount of arrests that have happened for PPP frauds. Well, David, we're coming up at the end of the show and we got a listener voicemail. So I want to make sure that we hit on that. Perfect. I have no more stories either. Okay, so cool. it's perfect timing. So I have not listened to this one yet. We're going into this one blind. So let's let's take a listen. Hi, Blake and David. It's Jonathan here from New York. I'm a newly licensed CPA. I'm working in industry right now for a real estate firm. I also have a bookkeeping side gig that I do in my free time. I use the Jaeger CPA review for my CPA exam studies, and it was on Phil Jaeger's podcast that I heard Blake for the first time. I really enjoyed and appreciated, Blake, how frank you were about the CPA exam and the accounting profession. When you plugged your own podcast, I knew it was something I needed to check out. I've been listening ever since, and I just wanted to say how much I enjoy it. It really gives uh, an amazing roundup of news, ideas, and technology that are really useful to me in the profession, and I'm sure to many others as well. I wish you guys all the continued uh, success, and keep up the great work. Thanks for all that you do. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan, and congratulations on getting your license. That's a big deal. Yeah. (laughs) So a lot of work. Probably did it faster than I did. (laughs) Now, did you use any of these review courses? Like he said, you used CPA, uh, Jaeger CPA Review when you did yours or? I did. I was not aware of Jaeger. Um, I, I ended up using uh, Glime. Yeah, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of like really well-known review courses, like the big ones like Becker. And then there's a whole slew of, of smaller companies that do this. Uh, one thing that's interesting about Glime, by the way, is you go to their website and they do – CPA review courses, enrolled agent review courses, but then also aviation f- exams for pilots and mechanics. Like, so it's an interesting. Uh, so their uh, uh, their expertise is in the testing testing. So they don't really care what kind of test it is. It, but no, it's only those two things. So it's like oh, only those uh, two industries. Yeah, okay. it's accounting and aviation, and they even have their own like um, flight simulator that you can purchase like, like one of those kind with like the three screens and the control panel and the, like, I, I, I just, this solves everything. But like you got to build an audit simulator <laughs> and that solves EY's problems. And then <laughs> and so there's like this whole level when you get your CPA, you have to go through the audit simulator and successfully perform this audit on a virtual company. You know, David, this is actually a great idea. You know how there's, are you much of a, you're not much of a video game person, right? I, I I play my Madden football. Okay, well, no, that doesn't count. Uh, so, <laughs> so there's like this whole resurgence of indie gaming. This this whole industry that is developed around games that are developed by small independent developers. You know, a few one person even or a few people, and they sell them on these app uh, game marketplaces that are, exist now, like a Nintendo Switch. Yep. And so, cloud has enabled a lot of new industries, right? So that that is one that I am passionate about. I love indie video games. So I was thinking, what if somebody made an audit video game where, you know, you're an auditor and you have to like navigate the ethical dilemmas of uh, of being an auditor and the challenges of like getting the information you need and actually taught you, it could actually teach you something while being fun. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe that's a, something we could do. If you're a listener. It would be like, it would be like uh, Grand Theft Auto kind of style. <laughs> yeah. May, maybe there would be, uh, I don't know if we want to uh, encourage, you know, uh, $2 billion frauds or anything like that, but you could certainly go there. That would be one way to do well, it. Well, no, it'd be the opposite. Like you could go ask for the bank statements and somebody doesn't give you the bank statements. You could punch them in the face. Like, give me the bank statements. Just, I like just a well, little bit of, you know. So if any of our listeners are excited about the idea of developing an audit themed indie video game. Let me know. That's something I would consider. And with that, we should wrap this up. <laughs> if anyone wants to give us a call, David, where's the best uh, way for them to do that? Uh, the phone number is 202-695-1040. That number takes you directly to a Google Voice. Leave us a, you know, a message about a minute long. It'll cut you off after three. So keep it pithy. And we'll take a listen and we'll uh, likely even play it on the air. And if you want to connect with me online, I'm at Blake T. Oliver on Twitter and LinkedIn. How about you, David? I'm at David Leary. Pretty easy to find. And everybody, please, 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 if you're listening to this, um, I'm assuming you're going to be listening to this on Monday at midnight on Monday, October 19th, we're going to turn off our survey. So hit the show notes for the survey link or just go find us on any of the socials. So Cloud Accounting Podcast on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. And there's links to the survey. We're tweeting about it every day. We'd love to hear from your, uh, it's it's two minute two minute survey and love to see or hear your feedback about the top issues in accounting. And if you are listening after the survey is already closed, um, do check out the the link because we will 
update it, I think, with the results, right, David? Yeah, so we will discuss the results live at the Accounting and Finance Show on the 20th. And then we will actually release that as a podcast episode. But then there'll be a link back to the original um, slide deck with the, with the results. Sounds great. Well, David, until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks. Time for the classifieds. I want to tell you about a new workflow solution called Baco Tech. Baco Tech is a cloud solution that puts CPAs in the middle of their clients' data. Baco Tech gathers clients' data and delivers it to CPAs in real time through one login, enabling CPAs to make adjustments to tax returns and client accounting issues as they happen, not at for year end. Baco Tech helps CPAs provide their clients with the proactive services they need and increases the firm's efficiency and leads to working less overtime and busy season. To learn more about Baco Tech, head over to bacotech.com. Looking to radically increase productivity as a cloud accountant? Introducing Client Hub's Frictionless Workflow, a unique combination of internal workflow seamlessly blended with client tasks and communications. See how a frictionless experience across your team and your clients will save you hours of time. Get started today with a free trial at clienthub.app. Enter promo code CAP25 for 25% off your first three months. Client Hub, truly frictionless workflow. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info, and be sure to check out our special stimulus pricing of four episodes for just $100.